those who couldn't, lost livelihoods, and all of our lives were disrupted by the pandemic. So digital disruption is, is really a very good, uh, a good way to begin uh, the year and to begin uh, what is, I think, a very critical discussion for the continent, both in terms of development um, uh, uh, as well uh, as uh, uh, of issues around sustainable and sustainability, which I think COVID has brought to the fore. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Elizabeth Sideropoulos. I'm the Chief Executive uh, of the South African Institute of International Affairs, and it's, it's really a great pleasure to be participating in this event uh, this morning. Um, 28 days ago, Africa began trading under the African Continental Free Trade Area, an ambitious project that many would argue was long overdue. And it comes, uh, it's the last in a long line of, of such, uh, I think, ambitious uh, projects, but one that is actually now coming uh, to fruition. Of course, this was the first step in a multi-phase process uh, of a continent-wide free trade agreement, which will face obstacles, no doubt, uh, whether it relates to finalizing a lot of the rules of origin, or services or many of the other items uh, and chapters that are on the agenda uh, for negotiation over the course of, of, of the next uh, couple of years. This, this milestone in, in Africa's trajectory, economic trajectory, developmental trajectory, is like no other previous one though. And this is important because it is happening at the time, at a time of what uh, we now call the fourth industrial revolution which presents huge opportunities, provided we can harness them. Uh, we're already seeing uh, hubs of innovation uh, across the continent. Some of them we'll hear about today, whether it's in Kenya or South Africa or Nigeria uh, or Morocco or elsewhere. Um, we know that leapfrogging is possible uh, in this digital world, but we do also need to be proactive in designing the policies and the regulatory frameworks. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, last year, I mean, the, the discussion about the 4IR and uh, the, the digital space and the digital economy uh, have uh, been part of the narrative for a, for a few years. But then last year, of course, we, we had the pandemic and we had COVID. We had a global lockdown. Uh, capitalism and consumerism uh, were confined to the barracks, or were they? Uh, sometimes the most difficult decisions can only be taken in a crisis. The pandemic, therefore, has created that crisis and that uh, opportunity. It's also, of course, uh, and we know that from our, our, our daily interactions, has also highlighted and probably deepened, exacerbated the inequalities uh, that, that faced the world uh, for, for, for decades now and which became much more acute probably over the last decade and have given rise to, to populism and chauvinism and, and all of that. So it's deepened these inequalities. It's also shown as the inequity of technological discrimination, or should we say technological apartheid. And it's also brought, brought home that the pace of change is so phenomenal uh, and that, po that policymaking and regulation have to respond to this different march of time uh, in a very different way from the way we, in which particularly uh, African policymakers may have done in the past. That this is to coin a phrase uh, with no reference to, uh, 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 to Donald Trump, but Operation Warp Speed. I mean, that's the rate at which things are changing. And so uh, African policymakers, uh, African societies, I think, uh, uh, have, to, have to understand what that means uh, for us to be able to take advantage of this. One last point um, is that, of course, the digital economy, e-commerce, all of those is, is value neutral. Uh, it has both disadvantages and advantages, significant advantages. It can do good, it can do bad. Uh, but to accelerate the good and to limit the bad, policymakers need to ensure that the frameworks, the regulatory environment, the governance uh, is, is, is correct. It's all in place. Uh, responsible technology uh, 
uh, governance. Some of these issues uh, uh, are, are, are cover, covered in, 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 the, in the report uh, that, is, that is on our website and that uh, Michelle will be, uh, will, will, will be speaking to. Uh, it's part of a, of a, of a series of, uh, of material and, and research that SIA uh, uh, has been uh, uh, working with, uh, with other part partners, uh, most notably also over the last couple of years with the e-commerce forum. Um, South Africa uh, to really uh, broaden uh, uh, the debate, create platforms for engagement on, on issues of the fourth industrial revolution, e-commerce, uh, the intersects uh, with trade, uh, the intersects uh, uh, with politics and, and global governance that are, are, are defining the 21st century, are defining uh, African uh, developments. Uh, and we're really uh, very pleased with uh, with the work and the cooperation with the variety of partners in putting this uh, uh, this event together, uh, but also uh, in terms of our broader uh, research uh, focus on 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 many of these uh, many of these issues. So that's just by way of uh, of, of introduction and and welcome. Uh, the experts in in the field will be before you in in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, they're the ones who are going to take this uh, this debate uh, this debate forward. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to it, um, um, uh, to participating and to and to learning and to learning more about it. Uh, but before I hand over to the uh, uh, moderator for the first for the first session, uh, and it's really great. Let me let me let me say that now to uh, to have uh, Jamie McLeod with us from the Trade Policy uh, from the African Trade Policy Center at the UN Economic Commission. Um, uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, housekeeping rules. I know by now you are all extremely familiar with uh, with using uh, Zoom, but just a couple of points to to remind you again if you have specific questions to pose, please pose them uh, in, in, in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, please do uh, introduce yourself in, 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 in the box, uh, uh, note your, uh, your affiliation and then pose the question, particularly also indicate who, to whom uh, you wish to, to pose the question. Of course, I know people also use the chat, uh, the chat box. Um, uh, and 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 we can use that certainly for uh, for uh, discussion and and for commenting. And I do have uh, my colleague uh, Cyril Prinsler, who will also be helping to to direct uh, the questions into the Q and A and uh, uh, to the moderators. But let's uh, let's keep the specific questions in 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 the Q and A. Um, I think I have. Uh, probably used up uh, more than I should uh, of my allotted time. I think it's important to to, to let the the experts speak speak for themselves. So um, uh, let me hand over now to to Jamie McLeod, uh, who will take us through the first uh, session uh, this morning. Jamie, over to you. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth, uh, for having me here. Uh, a real uh, privilege. Um, uh, and thank you for the South African uh, Institute for International Affairs and also e-commerce Forum Africa, who were uh, part of that introduction to be here. Um, uh, as Elizabeth as said, uh, my name is Jamie McLeod. I'm a trade policy expert at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, uh, where in particular I've been very uh, closely following the AFCTA negotiations, uh, participating in providing technical uh, support to them for the last uh, four or five years. Uh, and as well as that, uh, uh, leading a lot of our research at UNECA on uh, e-commerce and digitalization. Uh, so I'm very uh, pleased to be able to moderate uh, this session, uh, a, which is on digital disruption, COVID, and the formation of the AFCFTA. And in particular, this first session, uh, which is just under an hour in length, uh, focused on the policy considerations on, under that topic. So we have um, three really great speakers for the session, uh, which will be followed by a Q and A, as you can save up your, your specific questions for them. And before we begin, I'll just uh, give a, uh, to preface the session with some opening remarks, uh, highlighting some of our research in UNECA, and most recent research in the last few months on exactly these topics. Uh, and here I'd like to make uh, three points, uh, or look at three uh, kind of research points. And the first is, um, 
COVID as a digital accelerant uh, in Africa. So here, as I'm sure you're all aware, across the world, uh, COVID seems to have really accelerated the digital economy, where perhaps before the digital econ economy was coming, now it really is here and amongst us. And we see this, for instance, in the, the biggest tech stocks in the world, so six of them, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, Microsoft, Alphabet, and Netflix. Their stock market price, what uh, financial analysts think they are worth, has increased by $2.5 trillion in the course of last year, which is more than the entire economic output of uh, Africa in a year. Um, but also elsewhere in the world, if we look at Mercado, Mercado Libre in South America, their stock prices is up over 100%. Uh, in China, JD.com also up over 100%. Uh, and in, so our question was in Africa, uh, has, has this been the same or have there been other issues which have constrained us here? And for our research here, we looked at financial statements from uh, some of Africa's uh, biggest tech related firms. We surveyed businesses and we interviewed some of Africa's leading tech entrepreneurs. And what we found out was that more or less, yes, there has also been this accelerating effect in Africa, but it has been constrained. So you'll see impressive statistics uh, in the first half of last year, NTN's uh, Nigerian data consumption uh, it was reported to be up 33%. Jumia's active customers were up 42%, and PESA customers in East Africa were up 12%. When we spoke to small businesses uh, of a survey sample we, we, we spoke to, 62% reported an increase in e-commerce during COVID, and they reportedly new opportunities as well, despite all the challenges, for instance, in selling online and in using new technologies for services. Um, but uh, the entrepreneurs we spoke to, they said, uh, and this is to quote uh, one of them, they said that, yes, COVID accelerated businesses in some ways, but exposed deficiencies in others. And I think this is uh, what Elizabeth was saying in her opening remarks when she said, those who could went digital and those who couldn't lost their livelihoods. Um, the three main challenges that came back to us in this research was uh, firstly, internet access, uh, cost and reliability. Uh, still remains extremely limited across the continent. Um, only about uh, roughly a quarter to a third of Africans uh, actively uh, have access to the internet. And during uh, COVID with the additional pressure on uh, internet, the speeds across Africa fell by about 13%, which is twice as much as they fell elsewhere in the world. Uh, payment options are also severely limited in most places, um, online payment options. In East Africa, of course, there's uh, M-Pesa, but in other markets across Africa, uh, regulators still don't entirely always trust uh, mobile money. And that uh, means that uh, uh, e-commerce ends up relying too much on um, payment on delivery, which is far more expensive and cumbersome and frustrates cross-border payments and expansion. Uh, and the third point that they said to us was that logistics are still uh, a big inhibitor. Uh, only about 16% of Africans uh, can receive mail and parcels at their home. Um, and uh, universal postal union uh, data uh, suggests that Africa really struggles with the reliability of its postal system and reach in particular. The second point I wanted to make was about the AFC of TSE, a unique opportunity here. Uh, if you look at the African digital uh, transformation strategy, which one of our speakers was uh, heavily involved in leading, um, uh, it's one of the areas that it prioritizes in the area of digital trade is a digital single market in Africa. And the big justification here is that uh, the small size of many African markets, there are 22 countries in Africa with populations of smaller than that 10 million. And so when you speak to entrepreneurs, they say really to attract sufficient venture capital to expand and become competitive, they have to uh, branch into many different markets. You can't e rely on even a relatively large market like Kenya, you need to go to Uganda as well, uh, to, to Ghana as well, Rwanda, Tanzania, to be able to attract sufficient financing. Uh, and uh, when they do so, we spoke to these firms and we said, what could the AFCFTA or other regional trade agreements do to help that process? And the main two things they said to us was the harmonization of regulations, in particular in areas such as taxation, electronic trade, digital signatures, e-transactions, data standards and privacy laws, and also in consumer protection regulations for building online trust, which can often be lacking. Um, so this is something that the AFCFTA negotiators can exactly do with those negotiations. They'll nevertheless have important decisions to make about the extent to which they would like to harmonize, because there's always a trade-off here with 
policy uh, space, um, the more you lock into regional requirements or rules, the less individual space you might have as a country. And so they'll need to look at things about, you know, whether they want just cooperation frameworks in some areas or, or guiding principles or even the harmonized laws uh, in the most kind of integrated uh, extent. Uh, but uh, it's good to know that the e-commerce negotiations have now been fast-tracked under the AFCFTA and they will uh, take place this year. The third and most brief point I wanted to make was that um, uh, there's also another channel for digitalization to be an opportunity to make traditional trade easier. And here at UNECA, we have some upcoming research, uh, more in development on uh, digital trade facilitation, uh, which could also be a part of these AFCFTA negotiations on e-commerce, but already are. If you look at the annexes on um, trade facilitation, it already includes uh, uh, topics on uh, electronic trade facilitation, and these can be operationalized now. Uh, and there's a nice presence here in Africa with, for instance, the Comesa Digital Free Trade Zone, which does exactly that, looks at uh, you know, electronic rules of origin and electronic single windows, amongst others. Uh, so just to summarize those uh, opening kind of prefacing remarks, uh, yes, COVID has been an accelerating impact on the digitalization in Africa, but with challenges. The AFCFCA provides unique opportunity for harmonizing uh, rules uh, for a digital single market. And digitalization is also an opportunity to make traditional trade easier. Uh, now I will pass on to the first of our speakers, uh, an old friend of mine, uh, Memory Dube, who is uh, extremely experienced in the AFC uh, negotiations. I recall many times uh, with her uh, spending far too many hours in the late sessions that, that carried on late into the night as negotiators uh, squabbled over different topics. Uh, Memory is a regional integration and trade uh, policy specialist at the African Development Bank. Uh, she also functions as the AFDB's AFCFTA focal point in Accra. And she's previously worked with the delegation of the European Union to South Africa as a trade and economic uh, officer. And prior to that, uh, spent a number of years with your very own South African Institute of International Affairs, where she was a senior researcher in economic uh, diplomacy program. So, uh, Memory, let me pass over to you for uh, your intervention. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jamie. Um, and thanks to Saya for the invitation to participate in this webinar. And also thanks to um, Michelle and Alistair for an informative and insightful paper on uh, digital disruption within the context of uh, the AFCFTA. Now, um, I'm just going to dive right, right into it. And um, drawing from the recommendations in the paper, I'll focus my interventions more on the significance of investment and digitization to spur growth in Africa within the context of, uh, of the AFCFTA. And maybe we can start off uh, by contextualizing this discussion of which Elizabeth and Jamie have already done a bit of, um, focusing particularly on the COVID pandemic and the AFCFTA. So the economic impacts of the COVID pandemic have been dire and our private sector has been particularly hard hit. However, like Jamie and Elizabeth said, there were some ex exceptions. So companies that thrived and all because in the era of reduced physical contact, they use the power of digitization to engage and service their customers. So while the pandemic certainly precipitated and made more urgent the imperative um, for digital transformation, it is a process that was already unfolding globally um, under the auspices of the fourth industrial revolution. And it has become very clear that um, the combination of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to catch up with digital transformation is creating the foundation for um, tectonic shifts in how business is conducted, not only in Africa, but globally too. So the pandemic has allowed us um, a glimpse into the future of business and the global economy, but also post COVID, it has also reiterated um, the necessity of a digital and technological acceleration, or rather of digital and technological acceler acceleration for businesses um, in Africa. So business will have to learn to adapt as countries also naturally veer towards um, the digital economy. So the AFCFTA in this context is an enabler for digital transformation on the continent and can be leveraged to facilitate this shift towards the digital economy and expand it. And um, especially while we still, under, we still live under the pandemic and, and, and have to resort to digitization of most commercial, commercial processes wherever um, possible. So obviously the next question would be, how do we prop up the AFCFTA to achieve this? And to answer this, we need to explore the entire digital economy ecosystem in itself, as well as the actors involved. So who are the actors in the digital economy? Government, enterprises, and the consumers. 
And what do the actors need to effectively participate in and advance the digital economy? There are four elements to this answer. So there is a business and regulatory environment, so encompassing the policy, legal, and institutional issues and capacities. So we have to ensure that um, business, the business and regulatory um, environment in our countries is fit for purpose. So this can catalyze and spur growth, encourage investment and innovation, or it could actually act as an impediment to the development and expansion of the digital infrastructure um, ecosystem. And this involves such issues, of course, as liberalizing the market and incentivizing um, investment in digital technology and facilitating access to markets, so um, being the domestic, regional, and international markets. So in this respect, we need our um, regulators and policymakers to actually be nimble and agile, as this is a fast-evolving um, space. So techno technological advancements are actually moving at lightning speed. So here today and old news tomorrow, what do you think is some big advancement today, tomorrow it's been overtaken by something else. So the space is really um, um, fast moving. And secondly, there's uh, infrastructure. And of course here I'm referring to the actual physical infrastructure. And, and, and of course, with reference to Africa, infrastructure has been a long standing challenge. Um, and in this particular case, it is the lack of backbone ICT infrastructure, as well as the lack of energy infrastructure to support ICT. And including also including roads and logistics amongst others. And we must situate this within the context of uh, the huge infrastructure gap in Africa. Um, and the AFDB estimates that the continent needs about 130 to 170 billion dollars a year um, to, um, to cover the infrastructure gap. And we also have a financing gap of between 68 and 108 billion. So the need to address this infrastructure gap is actually quite um, you know, critical. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom, though, particularly when it comes to um, digital infrastructure. Um, the Infrastructure Consortium for Africa reports that investment in ICT infrastructure um, has been steadfast. And in 2018, digital infrastructure was financed to the tune of seven billion US dollars, and 80% of that came from private um, investors. However, for the purposes of e-commerce, for example, the focus would also be on um, I suppose what you'd call lightweight infrastructure, for want of a better phrase, um, such as mobile phones and similar devices that facilitate internet access. Um, but for Africa, I think statistics are already looking good in that area, with um, at least 72% of Africans already using cell phones regularly, um, with the only challenge, of course, being access to internet services. And again, that speaks to um, our infrastructure deficiencies. And then thirdly, there's also the human resource capacity. So looking specifically at uh, skills and technological talent. So lack of uh, digital skills within the continent is a challenge in the ecosystem. It stunts economic growth and innovation, and it deprives our burgeoning youth demographic of employment opportunities. Indeed, in the age of COVID, most forms of entrepreneurship would be highly reliant on digital connectivity. As we all know, we live in an era where, you know, um, physical content is, is highly discouraged. And then lastly, there's also um, the issue of the end user of digital technology. And of course, the end user is you know, the actors in the entire ecosystem. So we're looking at government, we're looking at the consumers, we're looking at uh, enterprises. And it goes without saying, of course, that the end users or players in this digital economy need to be technologically um, savvy to a certain extent, of course, they don't need degrees from MIT, but they need basic ICT skills to enable them to adopt and use um, technology. So what you get from this ecosystem is the critical need um, for investment to promote digitization of our economies, and by extension, e-commerce and digital trade. This is also imperative for the overall success of the AFCFTA, and especially as digital transformation is, is expanding to almost all economic sectors and will therefore be critical in expanding Africa's um, productive capacity. Now, um, the African Development Bank is, is a ready financier of digital infrastructure and services. We understand the transformational effects that uh, you know, digital infrastructure and services can have on our economies. And that's why we provide financing for projects ranging from infrastructure to digital service sectors, e-government, innovation and skills, digital identity and payment. And we also support the policy dialogue and um, 
you know, discussions that are required to leapfrog our economies in the digital era. The one big lesson, I think the one key takeaway from this um, pandemic is the value of operating smart economies transformed by the adoption of digital services, running over key data and connectivity infrastructure and with strong electronic payment systems. However, we do need to also make sure that such digital transformation is broad-based and fully inclusive. And um, I should mention here that uh, the AFDB is a founder member of Smart Africa, which looks to catalyze the adoption of smart um, tech-based solutions in Africa. And um, currently, Smart Africa is developing blueprints on digital identity, um, smart villages, broadband, and startup, startup and innovation um, ecosystems. So these blueprints identify key actions for government and the private sector to follow, including regulatory policy and institutional reforms to establish aspects of the smart, um, I mean, smart economy on the continent. So within the context of the lessons from uh, COVID, or rather the key lesson from COVID, it is important that governments actually build on the work of Smart Africa and the blueprints that it has developed and actually commit to invest in smart projects. This may be sectoral projects, for example, in agriculture or fundamental infrastructure and skills development projects, but it also gives Africa a great chance to participate as an equal in the fourth industrial revolution and the necessary investments for that should be made now. So COVID actually gives us an opportunity to leapfrog when it comes to that, um, to that space. And when you talk about investment, it's not only about sovereign investment. We need to incentivize private investment through extensive policy dialogue and regulatory institutional and legal reforms in an environment of rapidly growing data usage and the opportunity that the AFTFTA actually presents for access to cross-border markets. Um, for our private sector. As the AFDB, our activities in the digital transformation agenda are structured along five strategic areas of work, and these are connectivity, um, and the presumption, of course, here is that connectivity will be private sector-led. However, um, sovereign financing has often, often been required to expedite infrastructure investment. Secondly, there is data infrastructure and tech entrepreneurial financing. Again, this is private sector-led or financed via venture funds. Thirdly, e-government, which is, uh, of course, based on pure sovereign demand. So we have to rely on governments to actually come to us for that um, kind of assistance. Um, fourthly, there's also innovation infrastructure and skills, which covers physical hubs, connectivity to the hubs, and access to skills, training, academia, and, um, and finance. And lastly, um, we also provide support to government on key enablers um, to facilitate digital transformation. So find foundational digital identity and data pro protection and privacy regulation. Um, and I could go on and give examples of bank activities in this space, but I think I'm probably running out of time. So perhaps to just round up and, and identify the key issue areas for the AFTFTA in order for us to realize the full potential of the digital economy for um, economic transformation in Africa, we need to deepen regional, regional cooperation and harmonization of policies on digital um, transformation. So for the AFTFTA to achieve this, we need to have a legal framework to support IPR, intellectual property rights that are related to the digital economy, um, subject to subject, um, which is of course a subject of negotiations under phase two of um, the AFCFTA negotiations. Data protection is key, the collection, storage, and use of data, and how countries deal with this will um, effectively affect the scale and direction of digital trade and e-commerce. And so far, only 28 countries in Africa have data protection legislation in place, and out of that 28, only 11 actually have laws that address um, you know, cyber crime. There's also the need for consumer protection. Um, there's a regulatory vacuum here when it comes to um, e-commerce, especially that leaves consumers exposed without any recourse uh, mechanism. So that is something that needs to be addressed so that consumers are actually able to track the system enough to actually use um, e-commerce. And then there's also the issue of taxation, which is a key issue for governments. Um, so most of our tax regimes actually do not address e-commerce and it's high time that we started um, looking at that. Um, infrastructure and logistics, I already mentioned that before. Um, so infrastructure for internet access, as well as for the delivery of goods and services, that would be key for um, the advancement of digital trade and, um, and e-commerce. Skills development. 
how do we e-skill the labor market and how do we ensure that digitization also reaches the informal sector? Because as we know, um, the informal sector in Africa actually drives uh, or rather contributes a significant amount to, um, to our GDP. So that is very important that we skill the informal sector to enable them to participate um, in the digital economy. And then also e-payments and regional payment and sex settlement um, mechanisms. So looking at regional e-commerce, cross-border digital trade, this is very important to ensure that not only does digital transformation facilitate trade within our border, it also facilitates cross-border trade and um, contributes to the you know, enhancements of uh, the objectives of the AFDFTA. And we also need to look at uh, e-government. So, you know, consumers, the private sector, we all engage with government at some point. It is important, it is important that government actually lead um, by adopting e-government um, so that when, 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 when you know, other stakeholders, stakeholders engage with them, they're actually able to do that digitally. So government has to lead um, on that front. And lastly, it is also important to pursue um, partnerships. And um, this is particularly important when it comes to private sector development. As I mentioned earlier, some of the advancements that are needed in terms of um, digital transformation, some of the investments that are needed will have to come from the private sector. And it's important that government actually um, you know, or nurture these kinds of partnerships and relationships to make make sure that they actually create a conducive environment for the private sector to um, invest in this space. Um, I think I'm going to leave it here for now and we can pick it up um, in the discussion section. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maria. I think in that short amount of time, you managed to, to cover such a breadth of topics that I think I would have seen, uh, I know you could almost get a, a master's dissertation out of the, the breadth of, uh, of information shared. So thank you so much for that. Um, for the next speaker, I'd like to invite uh, Michelle Javonga, who's the founder and CEO of uh, Global Policy House, uh, a diaspora investment, digital economy and blockchain solution uh, business exploring emerging technologies in the context of emerging markets, trade, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, sustainable development. Uh, Michelle has been recognized as one of the top 10 women in blockchain in Africa. And certainly for us at UNAC, if we wanted to reach out for some, to someone for uh, information and advice on blockchain research, uh, Michelle would be uh, top of the list. And she's also one of the top 40 global fellows for uh, FinTech for Good, uh, who work alongside the UN and others. Uh, she's a senior advisor to several governments and global institutions. Uh, and in addition, she's also an ambassador to the World Union of Small Medium Enterprises. So, uh, Michelle, uh, a very warm welcome, uh, and I'll pass over to you for your, uh, your uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. A uh, real pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to Sia, definitely, for, for all the work that we've, uh, we've done with the report. Very, very exciting to be launching it, especially, uh, you know, during such a busy week. I know they have, you know, digital Davos going on as well, and today it's fourth industrial revolution focus. So very, very interesting that the world is, uh, is quite pivoted towards the digital economy uh, and very, very exciting indeed. I, I did have a short uh, PowerPoint uh, to just go through some of the findings that we had from the report. So if I could just uh, kindly get that from the team, that would be very helpful. Um, but yes, no, certainly, I think the world, uh, as Elizabeth was saying earlier on, the world has certainly pivoted into the digital economy. Um, and, and for us in the digital world is quite exciting actually, because over the last couple of years, we've gone and championed quite a lot, uh, you know, and, and tried to influence uh, even before COVID, you know, the opportunities that the digital uh, economy presents. And I think uh, in our world is actually quite an exciting time. Uh, it's been very, very difficult, of course, for the world, you know, uh, with the onset of um, and, and I suppose one of the challenges has been actually, what does actually digital mean? Because a lot of people refer to digitization, refer to, you know, the digital economy, but what does that mean? And that, you know, has different meanings in different, uh, different settings and different environments. So what we've done with the paper really is actually try to map out, you know, what do we mean by these digital disruptors? What are the digital disruptors doing? You know, what, what is it, you know, what are the opportunities with the digital disruptors, especially in the context of Africa and the CFTA? Uh, we certainly think that, you know, um, the African continental free trade area presents a massive opportunity, uh, a massive opportunity for growth, but also a massive opportunity for that intra-African trade, you know, to really happen. Uh, and in order for us to facilitate that to happen, we believe the digital economy 
uh, and the disruptors within the digital economy can play a massive role. So what I've done here is really just a very quick summary in terms of some of the findings that we, we have discovered in the report, and then made a couple of recommendations around what actually policymakers can, can do, but it's not just up to policymakers, as we've already heard. It's very much about partnerships and working in collaboration. If there's one lesson that COVID has taught the world is that we do need to collaborate. We're not you know, uh, living in isolation, and it's important for economies. Uh, in order for them to leverage the opportunities that come with uh, you know, those economies of scale and a whole range of other collaborations right at the heart. Uh, so for one, I think one of the discoveries, as much as technology is absolutely significant and plays a critical role uh, in, in developing growth, it is important that technology alone cannot, do, cannot be the answer. We have to invest in the right, uh, uh, you know, people skills and a whole range of other things. So what are uh, some of our findings and recommendations? I think one of the, the, the top, top, you know, thing that we are certainly calling for is that we need to take a different approach to data. Uh, it's all about data. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, if we, you know, data is kind of the new resource, data is a new intelligence, data is a new uh, opportunity to make decisions, you know, well-informed decisions that can help, even with COVID. Most economies have relied on data. Most economies have invested in, in, in data structures, uh, you know, and, and in almost kind of sourcing data to inform them, you know, to make decisions, be it about COVID, be it about stimulus packages and a whole range of other things. So data is certainly one of the most important uh, elements that we need to focus on. And I think for Africa, we need to have a strategy, a very strong, robust strategy around data. And of course, you know, using the digital disruptors I, I mentioned, you know, you can obviously look at the protections around data and, and use data securely, but you can also use things like artificial intelligence to be able to read and, and, and look at trends that are coming out of the data sets that you're looking at. So, so data, we have to look at a little bit more deeply. I think it's, it's certainly not a topic we can cover all today. Very important that, you know, in the report for us, we identified, you know, one of the big gaps is actually, uh, you know, building up skills and ensuring that we have some, you know, training programs in place that we can ensure that they, we're skilling up uh, Africa's population. Africa's population is a very youthful population, it's a massive, you know, uh, a resource, probably the most important resource, and we need to invest in, uh, you know, sort of skilling up Africa's population. And it's not necessarily just skilling up in terms of digital skills or coding. Yes, that is important, but I think we need to be able to think about the future of Africa when we're talking about trade and, and trade facilitation. You know, when we're talking about small medium enterprises, which make up most of Africa, you know, those are the kind of the engines of growth for Africa. So we need to be able to, to skill up and, and provide support, uh, you know, to, to, the, to those dynamics. Um, and certainly investing in Africa and an African wide education program is something that we have called for uh, strongly in the report, as you will see. Uh, education is, is, is absolutely critical. You know, education in sort of new forms of uh, uh, digital uh, enablers is important because that will help to fuel up, um, you know, young people, young entrepreneurs, startups and businesses to actually gear up and use these digital solutions so that they can actually untap value. Uh, create new new uh, value chains, create new business models, and actually drive forward that interregional growth that we are all looking for. Uh, certainly, you know, one of the areas I have been very heavily involved in is actually looking at sort of digital financing packages. So the future of money is going to be very, very different. It's actually quite, quite exciting, right? It's no longer just a case that we have the traditional financing institutions that we need to focus on. There's a whole new world of digital financing that is coming to fore. Africa is not uh, uh, new to digital financing. You know, we've had the likes of mobile money payments and a whole range of others flowing across our economies. Now we need to be able to take that and scale that uh, in order to support that, uh, that growth and that industrialization that we are all seeking. So, you know, having a bit more of a focus around digital financing package is really, really important. We've highlighted that in the report. And starting to understand these new models of finance is actually critical and very, very important, I think, for, for Africa, especially that we have, as we've heard already, shortfalls around sort of infrastructure financing, shortfalls in, in agribusiness financing. These are areas that will fuel up industrialization and growth. And so we must be able to try and source the right investments to support that. Uh, and then of course, you know, tackling some of the challenges that we've talked about already, connectivity issues, you know, this is a subject that's been ongoing for a very long time. 
uh, without connectivity, without access to affordable data, without you know strong regulatory policies, you know harmonizations of rules, and uh, you know you, you present a very complex environment in order for for entrepreneurs or startups or people within the digital economy to actually operate. So in order to create that enabling environment, in order to bring that uh, tech talent that you, we we all want, uh, in order to spur the startups, you know, we need to be able to to tackle some of these challenges head on, and really focus the investments towards this and and in and, and creating that enabling environment. And great attention, I suppose, you know, needs to be paid to the emerging technologies, you know, because these emerg emerging technology are being used across Africa already, you know, in Rwanda, in Kenya, in Ghana, uh, you know, in a whole range of other places in Africa. It makes me so so proud having been in the digital economy since around sort of 2010 and and and, and so that in the blockchain field for a very long time now uh, it makes me proud that i can see solutions in africa you know solutions that are being led by african solutions that are actually being developed on the continent and we need to protect the ips of those solutions we need to be able to to scale up and and and, and grow those solutions uh, next slide please so these are kind of some of the findings that we have uh, we have looked at, uh, you know, and, and one of the challenges actually is more around uh, what are the key areas that you know policymakers need to focus. But it's not just about policymakers; it's about those you know private public partnerships. It's really important that the private sector plays its role, uh, and then policymakers actually look at these you know critical areas, some of which have already been spoken about. You know, connectivity is absolutely important, but investment is also absolutely key. We need to diversify opportunities for investment. We need to diversify and create that enabling environment. So it's not just a case we're reliant on just foreign direct investment, but we're creating a whole new climate of investment uh, activity within the continent. You know, we're looking at uh, uh, venture capitalists within the continent. We're looking at new forms of finance within the continent. We're looking at digital financing. Uh, we're looking at uh, decentralized financing, you know, very, very exciting space. And I think we can start to create that uh, within Africa. Africa is in a very strong uh, advantage actually compared to the rest of the world because we have gone and now created this largest kind of single market. There's a huge appetite, youthful uh, population, uh, you know, massive opportunities for investment and growth. And I think developing or building up the capital markets within Africa is something that really needs to be looked at very, very closely. Regulation and, and rules and harmonization, we've heard about strongly, I'm not going into too much detail around that, but certainly around, you know, sort of IP, you know, intellectual property protection, I think is very, very important for Africa. The more and more we build data, the more and more we create data, uh, within Africa and we protect that data using the same digital disruptors that I'm talking about, you know, we can really start to untap value and start to create wealth within the continent. And it's very, very important. I think we look at how we protect IP, we look at how we, we strengthen our regulatory frameworks, but also we must be able to enforce certain regulatory, uh, you know, frameworks in place to facilitate that, uh, that growth that I'm talking about. Privacy is a big debate at the moment, you know, privacy around data, you know, if you don't, don't consider the privacy of individuals or you don't put forward people's uh, concerns around data, around privacy and how they want to be able to protect their data, then we're missing the trick. I think as uh, in Africa, we need to kind of come together and say, okay, how, what does privacy actually look like for the continent? How are we going to utilize data? How are we going to be clever about tapping on uh, emerging technologies to actually protect data, to actually look at privacy, uh, you know, solutions through things like distributed ledger technology, DLT, blockchain. You know, there's massive opportunities to actually look on the privacy service and lead in providing uh, a, a privacy governance framework that works. Uh, for the people, right? Because one of the biggest concerns at the moment is actually how do I control my data? You know, I don't want to necessarily be reliant on just the big tech firms to 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 untap value from the data. You know, I myself want to monetize my data. I myself want to have a say in how data is utilized and where data goes and, and how data flows from one one end of, of Africa to the other and even internationally. We need to be able to have a competitive environment, you know, competition thriving within uh, within our economy. So you don't have just one dominant players. We need to consider the big and the small, especially the small, you know, uh, and how the small is protected and how the small businesses and, and operators are around Africa, you know, have also that competitive advantage and can actually um, interact and take advantage what, with the digital economy. And I think with the digitization and the range of digital tools that are coming into four, there's massive opportunities to really untap that. 
Uh, we've talked already around data. You know, cybersecurity is absolutely critical. Uh, or for most businesses, institutions, governments, uh, you know, banks, central banks, security is 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 right right at the top. And I think when you're starting to look at cybersecurity, you have to cyber-proof economies. You have to have the right cyber uh, strategies in place. And investing in in in, in the next, you know, uh, cyber talent, I think, is also very important. Just like AI, artificial intelligence, as well, quite key. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and, and I kind of included this slide because one of the, uh, this has just kind of come out from, from GSMA in terms of looking at the investments going on on the continent. As you can see, it's, you know, very, very spread across the, the continent, but there are some big players within the continent that are leading in, in terms of, you know, accessing uh, funding, uh, especially for, for startups. This is sort of African startup uh, funding map here. And you can see, you know, some of the, the this is rising and growing. But what we want to see is actually to spread this across the uh, across the continent, rather than having you know centralized in, in in certain hotspots of Africa. But it's also very very positive and encouraging to see actually there's a heavy investment into startups. There's a heavy, uh, you know, sort of interest in in building those next generation uh, startups. We want to look at you know building up the next uh, unicorns, if you like, you know, from Africa. Uh, at Global Policy House ourselves, we're very, very keen to look at how do we actually spur financing so that we can equip the next startups so or the next entrepreneurs, women-led businesses, uh, you know, youth, uh, social enterprises and, and, and groups like that to actually help because with investment, uh, I think you're supporting and you're building some very strong businesses which will be able to scale. I think the challenge is very much around how do we get the startups from just being startups to actually scale their businesses and how do we cyber proof them, how do we protect, how do we look at those digital tools to ensure that they can start to scale and grow their business so that they can start to operate across borders, so that they can tap on digital financing so they can operate you know, across borders. They can look at you know, blockchain based uh, uh, platforms that they can use to, to interact digitally and virtually across you know, uh, international markets as well. You know, this is putting everybody at equal level playing field with the rest of the world, which is really, really important. But over 500 million in West Africa investments in 2020, over 600 million in East Africa, which is pretty much leading. East Africa has been doing quite a lot around uh, innovation, you know, and, and, and a lot of activity going on there. A, a lot happening in Egypt, a lot happening in South Africa. But we also need to start to think about, okay, how do we spare, almost kind of spread this across to other smaller, you know, countries on, on the continent? How can we help them to actually come up, uh, you know, sort of to the, to the same levels? And also encouraging new VCs and venture capitalists and new forms of financing. You know, so we start to explore and, and, and discover things like central bank digital currencies, which you referred to in the report. What does that actually mean for Africa? Do we need central bank digital currencies? Is that something of priority at the moment? Have we got the right structures? Have we got the right governments, sorry, governance structures in order to enable those uh, uh, digital financing to, to happen? Certainly things like, you know, cryptocurrency, which of course you have to take tackle with the absolute, you know, you have to be very cautious and very careful in terms of how you approach these new forms of financing, but it's still, we cannot ignore them. We cannot pretend they don't exist. I mean, the crypto market is now a trillion dollar uh, industry, you know, and growing daily and, and evolving daily. So very, very important. And I know, you know, in Nigeria, in South Africa, you know, there's a heavy growth, you know, there's an increase in sort of the, the, the crypto usage and looking at decentralized finance, which again is a new form of finance coming to fall. So we kind of highlight in the report that it's important we do look at these new modes of finance. We look at how do we look at regulation around these new models of finance. We look at how to untap, you know, access to these uh, digital financing so to enable uh, African businesses and, and, and new, you know, women-led businesses to untap uh, um, you know, kind of capital from, from these markets. And next slide, please. And finally, just to, just to, to summarize, I mean, there was a, a slide I had put up in there in terms of actually, how do we look at uh, digitizing to support uh, the implementation uh, of, of CFTA? I think we've kind of gone, gone over the hurdle now where we're saying, you know, are we going to look at CFTA? Yes, we have you know, launch CFTA, it's fully, you know, people are trading, people are doing business, but how do we look to digitize? How do we encourage digital trade? How can we ensure that there's that flow of data and that flow, you know, across the value chains? 
supply chains have been heavily affected all across the world. You know, it's not a case of one, one region or the other. Supply chains is one of the areas where COVID really shone the light and said, you don't really have that transparency. You don't have the trust. You know, so the trading, the whole trading system, I think, lacks trust, needs trust, needs to create opportunities in terms of like opening up those regional value chains we've heard about. But also, you know, using these tools as enablers to actually facilitate trust, improve things like KYC, improve access to, um, you know, investments and finance, improve access to other new markets for new players, exporting, importing. Uh, I think that is the value when you have things like blockchain. You know, blockchain is pretty much the trust machine in the sense that blockchain itself is very, very boring technology, actually. I know a lot of people get very excited about it, but it does, you know, uh, a lot around kind of verification and ensuring that you have that very clear verification process, but also creates trust in a system when you don't know who you're kind of operating or dealing with. When you need access to data, when you need to record certain information and you need to look back and look at the audit trail, when you need to create credit history for small and medium enterprises, when small and medium enterprises need to access capital and finance, microloans, you know, very, very important technology to do that. But the key thing to really take away today, you know, around the disruptors, we cannot look at technologies, you know, individual technologies in isolation. It is important we start to think of them as converged. Uh, technologies where we can untap value from the combination of things like AI, blockchain, IoT, uh, you know, and then you kind of cyber proof all that and, and provide, you know, new decentralized applications, uh, new products and services that will come to the market. And of course, in certain economies where you can start to enable things like uh, digital currency, uh, the flow of money is very, very important the ease of payments, you know, payment gateways, and ensuring we have some APIs that are connecting all that. So interoperability across systems is also very, very important. And, and I think that will help with the whole thing around digitization. But this is some of the findings of the report. Uh, and, and I very much welcome your, your feedback and, and your comments, but been very, very exciting. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for sharing with us, uh, again, a great breadth of extremely interesting uh, and wonderfully made uh, points. And um, uh, if you'd like any uh, further information on that, you can see in the, the Zoom webinar chat uh, function that uh, our colleague Cyril has uh, shared a link to that paper. So you're welcome to connect through there and uh, have access to read uh, through more carefully in your own time. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jean Bertrand Azapmo. Uh, he's a regional trade advisor in the office of the AU Commissioner for Trade and Industry. Uh, someone with a, a tremendous amount of experience, 17 years uh, in trade and trade-related policy formulation and negotiations and implementation in the Africa and uh, Asia Pacific regions. Having also provided strategic advice to the AU Commissioner for Trade and Industry on a wide range of trade-related issues, including particularly the negotiations for the AFCFTA and the start to trading as well as the development of the AU Digital Transformation Strategy and the AU Digital Trade Strategy, as well as initiating the African Union e-commerce conference series in 2018 that perhaps many of you in participation have also taken part in. Um, uh, Jean Bertrand, let me uh, pass over to you uh, for your remarks. Thank you very much. See, Jean Bertrand, do we have you? Uh, do we have you? In with May us? Yes. edition, uh, Jean Bertrand Zapmo, that's my name. And uh, I am principal advisor to the uh, AU Trade Commissioner. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, can hear you very clearly now. Thanks, Jean. Oh, oh, okay, because my network is a bit unstable from time to time. Um, I think Elizabeth uh, put it very nicely. Uh, um, in her introductory remarks, you know, when she uh, uh, she spoke about, you know, how our lives were uh, transformed when uh, the pandemic struck, you, you know, those who were able to go online uh, saw their lives, um, uh, their life kept going, uh, but those who were not, um, you know, their life uh, kind of came to a, a, a stall. I think that's actually gives us a picture, a clear picture of what uh, uh, this disruption that uh, 
uh, we are talking about in this uh, in, in in this conversation uh, it really means you know uh, it means different things for different people. Colleagues have spoken about quite a few number of important issues, um, and uh, so I, I will just focus my attend my my intervention um, uh, on four main points. Uh, first of all. Uh, I will concur with um, uh, uh, the previous speakers, in particular uh, Alastair and uh, and Michelle, who put together the the, the report we we, we uh, which is serving the basis for our conversation. That, that is, um, digitalization will definitely accelerate the uh, uh, realization of the AFCFTA uh, uh, agenda. I think they uh, kind of provided a number of. Um, uh, examples of uh, 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 online so digital solutions um, that could really help uh, the AFCFTA achieve its uh, its objectives, um, and and some of which you know relate either to the supply side or to the demand side. So, uh, for for example, if you look at um, uh, uh, the supply side, you know increasing. Uh, production of uh, goods uh, uh, for selling on the in the AFCFTA market, um, whether uh, it's the use of uh, uh, 3D printing, we've seen this uh, uh, during this uh, uh, pandemic, um, whether it's the use of uh, uh, blockchain um, to enhance the management of the non-tenure system across the continent, uh, uh, the non-tenure system, which is critical for uh, production of agricultural commodities. Um, or even uh, the use of uh, digital ID, you know, something that ECA uh, and, and the AU Commission have been working on, um, you know, in facilitating trade in services, you know, particular, in particular temporary movement of, uh, of natural person to supply service uh, across the continent. So uh, definitely when it comes to the supply side, uh, it is very, very uh, uh, likely that, um, and we are seeing it already, uh, that uh, uh, you know, digitalization will will help address some of the supply side constraints that uh, uh, intra-African trade has been confronted with. Uh, similarly, when it comes to um, the business enabling environment, uh, financial payment and inclusion. Um, or the use of uh, even machine learning, because uh, re remember one of the uh, uh, non-tariff barriers to trade in Africa is the multiplicity of not just currency, but also languages, you, you know, so you, you have solutions like uh, machine learning, which could uh, which are helping already, you know, some of the uh, uh, businessmen uh, be able to, 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 to exchange and to overcome the, the, the language barrier. Uh, similarly, when it comes to facilitating policy and business uh, uh, decisions, there are a number of um, uh, uh, tools that are put in place to uh, facilitate this process. Uh, uh, you know, here I, I, I make reference to the African Trade Observatory, which will provide um, a, a platform for uh, availability of qualitative and quantitative data to support the policy making process. So it, it, it is very clear that um, uh, digitalization will accelerate the uh, realization of the AFCFTA objectives. There are also a number of uh, operational operational instruments of the AFCFTA, uh, which are powered by digital technology, uh, which will facilitate the implementation of the agreement and in so doing also contribute to um, uh, accelerate uh, uh, the digital economy. Uh, and here I'm, I'm looking at the online non-tariff uh, barriers uh, for reporting, uh, monitoring and elimination um, and eliminating uh, uh, non-tariff uh, uh, barriers. I'm looking at the uh, Pan-African uh, payment and, and settlement uh, uh, systems. So it, it is very clear that, um, you, you know, uh, digitalization, the, I mean, the AFCFTA will also play a role in, in accelerating uh, uh, the digitalization of the African economy. Now, on the demand side, I think colleagues um, uh, have spoken uh, eloquently about um, uh, this uh, large market of 1.27 uh, billion consumers that the, the the AFCFTA 
create and, and that's an opportunity for scaling up uh, production. Um, we also very much aware of the importance of the uh, African middle class, uh, currently estimated at 350 million uh, people and estimated to rise to 600 million uh, by 2030, which is just uh, uh, nine years uh, uh, down the road. So th th there is going to be that symbiotic uh, uh, relationship between the AFC, FTA and, and, and digitalization. Um, and the, 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 the other way uh, uh, the, the AFC, FTA is going to uh, to help further accelerate uh, digitalization on the continent is by pro uh, providing the enabling environment that is uh, th that is needed. And in doing so, it will also address some of the issues that were um, uh, uh, rightly uh, uh, outlined in the uh, 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 in the report. Uh, we have various protocols. Uh, it's true. Uh, uh, very often we look at uh, the protocol on e-commerce, but beyond the protocol on e-commerce, which will facilitate cross-border uh, uh, digital trade and e-commerce across the continent, there are other uh, supportive um, uh, protocols, uh, some of which are already in place, because if you take the case of trading goods, the protocol on trading goods, for example, um, and, and countries are... Uh, some of the countries have already, uh, some of the state parties have already submitted their market access offers, but others are still working on those. And through the market access offers, there is an opportunity to liberalize goods and to prioritize those digital goods or to prioritize uh, services, sectors that will contribute to accelerate uh, the digital, um, uh, the realization of the digital economy uh, on the continent. Um, and, and of course, we have um, uh, uh, the, the protocol on, on e-commerce, uh, uh, Jamie spoke about it, uh, which was supposed to be uh, uh, part of phase three negotiations, but uh, there is now a summit decision to uh, conclude all negotiations by 2021, which means um, that uh, the uh, uh, negotiations on the e-commerce protocol will be front loaded and will be um, uh, starting uh, uh, very soon. Uh, but there are also uh, three uh, equally important uh, protocols uh, which are in the pipeline. Uh, one on investment, the other one on intellectual property rights, which is critical for um, driving innovation uh, on the continent. Uh, Michelle and, uh, and um, uh, Memory spoke about uh, uh, the importance of that protocol, as well as the, the protocol on, on competition uh, policy. Now, um, what I want to address now is um, uh, what one question that also came up um, um, as previous uh, speakers were uh, uh, making their, their, their statement. Um, that is, how do we make sure that uh, the digital disruption uh, that um, has been caused by COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic becomes an enabler of inclusive and sustainable development uh, on the continent. The issue of um, inclusivity was uh, 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 raised earlier, uh, but there is also another dimension, you know, sustainability, uh, which we also need to, to take into consideration. Um, now, I, I, I would like to bring to your attention um, uh, the existence of this uh, report, which was uh, uh, released uh, very recently. Uh, that is the Africa's Development Dynamic uh, uh, Report, which focuses on digital transformation for quality jobs uh, in Africa. This report was uh, published by the, uh, the Commission uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, the OECD Development uh, Center. Now, the, the report, identifies uh, four main um, uh, critical areas that should be uh, looked into in order to ensure that um, uh, the digital disruption that we've observed, the uh, acceleration of digitalization that we've observed, that it really leads to inclusive and sustainable uh, development on the continent. One is universal ac access. And I think colleagues have also um, uh, made some very uh, uh, interesting development on, on, on that issue. Uh, the second thing is making uh, technology a level of productivity. Now, this is very important because one of the questions um, and one of the concerns we have uh, within the commission uh, from a policy perspective is what is it that is being sold on all the 
um, uh, e-marketplaces that we have on the continent. Um, some of the colleagues uh, did, you know, uh, an anecdotal survey of some of the web, uh, websites and uh, uh, online market places just to realize that it, it's actually just good that is imported from outside the continent. So we haven't reached a level where, um, you know, we can confidently say, uh, you know, digital trade e-commerce is actually going to really help uh, uh, increase production and productivity on the continent. So it is very important that um, we take that into, in, into consideration. And then the, 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 the other area is um, uh, skills development. I think colleagues also uh, uh, spoke about it. Now, what is very interesting with uh, skills uh, uh, development is very often we, we, we tend to focus on uh, the youth um, on uh, the, the business community, which is very important, uh, which is critical, but uh, there is another dimension, um, and and it is the uh, the institutions, uh, the public institutions driving, um, e e you know, uh, e, e commerce policies and the enabling environment. So there is also a need to think about. Um, you, you know, very uh, uh, customized training programs, skills development programs uh, for the policymakers, for the legislators, you know, so as to ensure that they, they also uh, have a clear understanding uh, of, of, of what it takes to really harness uh, uh, the digital uh, economy. Um, and then the, the last issue uh, or the last area, which is uh, also critical and was uh, highlighted by previous speakers, uh, relates to a coordination of the multiplicity of uh, policies that we observe, whether at the national, regional, continental, or international uh, level. Now, um, th th this is also very uh, important, and I want to spend a few uh, minutes on it because, uh, on the one hand, we have um, uh, given the, the, the dynamic nature of uh, in innovation, uh, countries are actually playing catch up with the private sector. And at the regional level, uh, there is also a, 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 a kind of a delay because uh, most uh, regional economic communities with few exceptions like uh, COMESA uh, are still uh, waiting to see how the members, what direction the member state are going to take. Same thing at the uh, continental level. At the international level, we know what is happening uh, uh, at the WTO. But there is a need to ensure that um, uh, Africa preserves uh, the policy space that is needed so that when the time comes to uh, putting together a continental um, uh, policy that we do not find ourselves in a situation where we've already um, uh, we, 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 we have our hands tied by certain uh, whether uh, policies that were adopted at the international level or in, in our bilateral uh, engagement with um, uh, non-African countries. Uh, and, and this goes to the issue of um, uh, third party agreements in the context of the AFCFTA. So it is very important that as African countries continue to engage with um, uh, non-African countries on trade issues, some of which include uh, e-commerce that uh, they are very uh, uh, mindful of uh, of losing that uh, that policy space. Now let me uh, uh, conclude with um, uh, one issue uh, which was also mentioned, but uh, which I think is is, is very important. Uh, this has to do with uh, the roles of institutions, the type of institutions that we have. Uh, I know Michel spoke about uh, uh, governance. Now, there is uh, a book uh, uh, written uh, by uh, Neil Ferguson on um, which is titled Why Nations Fail, the Origins of Power, Prosperity and Poverty. And the author highlights the, um, uh, in the book, the author, the author highlights the importance of uh, the type of institutions that are put in place. Um, you know, which ultimately uh, determines um, uh, the, 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 out, the developmental outcomes in terms of whether it's poverty or wealth that is uh, uh, um, uh, derived. So the, the question is whether uh, Africa 
African countries and governments have the type of institutions that is actually required to harness the potential of uh, digitization, whether um, you know, look at it from in, in the context of the fourth industrial revolution or in the context of the AFCFTA. And um, uh, this is very important because whether we are looking at policy formulation uh, policy implementation or even policy negotiations. Uh, we, we are living in the world of, uh, in, in, you know, uh, unusual business. Um, with the digital uh, economy, uh, it is very clear that the private sector is often on top of uh, the uh, implications, the uh, um, the ramifications of uh, uh, what uh, the uh, uh, various technologies in, entails, unlike you know, in the previous um, uh, industrial revolution, the governments were actually at the forefront. So wh what approach um, uh, should be uh, adopted by the, uh, uh, by African institutions? Um, how adaptatives are African institutions, you know, in terms of policy uh, making? Uh, when you look at some of the policies uh, in, in most African countries, they are very old, uh, they are rarely updated, they are outdated. So the, going forward, there is a need to uh, ensure that um, our institutions are able to adapt themselves very quickly, uh, that they, are, they, they understand the need for uh, collaborative and uh, consultative policy making. And, and, and like I said uh, earlier, uh, you know, some of these areas are more uh, are well understood by uh, the private sector than government. So it is very important to shift uh, um, uh, the way we, 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 we normally uh, uh, do policy uh, formulation. Um, but there is also a need to uh, ensure that um, we, we, we have coalitions of winners and, and that uh, at, at the, at the Pan-African level, we, we have someone who champions uh, the, uh, the digital uh, economy. This is something that um, uh, uh, Ambassador Mochanga, the, the Trade Commissioner has been advocating for, you, you know, especially going forward. Uh, because what we've realized is that the, 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 there are a number of policies um, that have been adopted, whether at the national uh, regional or continental level, uh, and which have the potential to um, accelerate uh, uh, digitalization, the digital economy on the continent, but which are not implemented. Um, if I take the case of uh, uh, data protection, for example, cybersecurity, there is a convention since uh, 2015, 1415, uh, there is a, a convention on cybersecurity and personal uh, data protection on the continent. But when you look at the level of ratification, it is very low, not to say insignificant. So th there is really a need for um, our various institutions, whether at the national uh, regional uh, continental level to um, adjust to the new reality. Uh, that is, we, we, we are living in um, uh, you know, an era of uh, uh, unusual business and um, uh, it is only through adaptation, uh, through um, a, a, a reset process uh, that we will be able to put in place uh, the type of um, enabling environment that is needed to make digitalization really work uh, for uh, the continent. Final point, the issue of um, uh, uh, corporate social uh, responsibility, which is also linked to uh, uh, sustainability. Uh, back in 2013, uh, uh, Richard Branson published a book titled Screwed, uh, Screw Business as Usual. And what is interesting with the book is he, he was mainly looking at the need to to, to shift from um, you know, a management uh, uh, approach or mindset that look at the profit only uh, towards you know, a new approach that will look at creating a shared value for the people, for the planet, and for anyone who is affected by the business. Now, one question is um, whether the new actors of uh, you know, the digital economy, especially in the private sector, whether they, 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 ha they have embraced this uh, you know, new mindset that uh, um, uh, Richard Branson and other um, you know, people, including um, uh, 
John Elkington with the uh, uh, triple bottom line principles have been advocating for. So it is very important that um, the, uh, the private sector, the African private sector um, champions a new approach to uh, the digital economy. Let it not be what um, uh, we, we, we see in other parts of the world, which is very concerning because like um, uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, pointed out, it is creating a kind of technology inequalities. So I think uh, my, my final point would be, it is very important for the, for the African private sector uh, working either uh, individually or working in partnership with other uh, uh, global players to, to, to really champions and to lead this notion of a, an inclusive, a, a sustainable uh, a, a digital economy, especially when it comes to, to, to the African uh, uh, continent, because th that's the, 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 the space we have. We can determine what happens in that space, and we need to make sure that whatever happens in that place works not just for the corporate, but it works for the people, it works for our environment, and that uh, ultimately uh, we, 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 we get out of this uh, process better off than we are now. With that, I thank you once again, and apologies for going uh, a, a little bit uh, uh, beyond my time. Uh, Jean Bertrand, thank you uh, so much for, for giving you uh, 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 giving us uh, the time for, from from your side. Uh, I think speaking of uh, institutions, it's great to have the perspective of the formal kind of continental institution of the uh, African Union Commission. So very much appreciated there. Uh, I, I do realize that we have exceeded our time. I was hoping that we could take some live uh, uh, questions from the participants. However, um, as you'll be aware, there's a question and answer function. Uh, so please, and, and some of you already have been, please share your specific questions uh, on that. I, I notice uh, memory has already been responding to some of those questions. Uh, and I would invite uh, Michelle and Jean Bertrand to also uh, respond to questions uh, on that uh, format. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you very much uh, to our, our three brilliant speakers uh, for the excellent job they've done in sharing a tremendous amount of information and knowledge from their respective uh, positions. Uh, and also to the participants for taking uh, part uh, and, and for sharing with us already in the Q&A some, some tricky and great questions. Um, and I believe now uh, I can pass on to Alistair Tempest, who is the moderator of the next session in this uh, today's uh, 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 format. Thank you very much for your time. Jamie, thank you very much indeed, and, and, and thank your panel very much for setting the scene. What we want to do in the second panel is look more perhaps at the stakeholders and particularly, uh, obviously, business and how business is going to react or will hope to react uh, to the African free trade area and the digital disruption. What I noticed in some of the questions uh, was an issue which uh, I think it was uh, Ashif uh, Patel raised um, about the re-industrialization of Africa. And I think we, we need to always remember that the, the really important aim, or at least in my view, the really important aim of the African free trade area is to uh, restart uh, I think we use the word uh, renaissance, in fact, in our paper, um, industrialization. So it, it's gone through a phase of deindustrialization. Now we have to restart it. But by industrialization, we don't just mean goods. We mean products uh, in general, which also includes services, incredibly important. What we say at the end in our recommendation, we say, uh, firstly, that the COVID pandemic has shown that uh, African economics has lacked diversity, or lacks, sorry, diversity. And that's very clear. It came out a lot uh, in, in the whole process over the last year. But secondly, that we really need to produce more of what Africa um, uh, consumes and to consume more of what Africa produces. 
I, I think that was Michel's uh, phrase, I, I love it. Produce more of what Africa consumes and consume more of what Africa produces. And that I think is the key to the whole of the African free trade area. Putting digital disruption, di technology, etc., cetera, uh, either before or after um, in industrialization is rather like arguing which came first, the chicken or the egg. We, we shouldn't go into that. Uh, debate because I think it's just a waste of time. What we need to do is to ensure that digital disruption creates more industrialization. So having said that, uh, can I please John, John Stewart of Trelag. Uh, John is uh, a, an economist and also um, uh, a policy analyst specifically at trade and digital trade. Um, and he has enormous experience in that field. So John, please, could you give us 10 minutes of your time? What we will do is 10 minutes for each speaker. And I'm hoping that Elizabeth is going to allow us a little bit of time at the end for questions. And perhaps at that stage, all the panelists from the two sessions can join together to answer questions. So over to you, John, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Alistair. Um, if I may, I'd like to use um, some slides, uh, which always helps me focus uh, my thoughts. So let me just um, uh, get that together. All right. Um, can I hear if, if um, can you see those, that slide? Yep, that's, um, that's great. We've got it. Right, look, it looks good. Okay, so I've just got a couple of slides, which just helps me organize my thoughts. Um, I found the paper very interesting. And um, I particularly like the concept of digital disruption because although disruption has a negative context, uh, these, these kind of changes always lead to medium and long run uh, improvements, um, real improvements in efficiency. Um, and it's no different with what we're looking at here. So I was asked to specifically focus on the, uh, the use of um, DLT, digital ledger technology, um, of which blockchain is a technology, was a subset of those technologies. For the for the uh, promotion of um, cross border trade in Africa, um, and so I have a few um, trying to just page down here, a few points. So when when I look at the paper, it discusses the the value of um, DLT digital ledger technologies for several applications, um, with finance, cryptocurrency, cybersecurity, healthcare, and assisting uh, MSMEs. Uh, it has a it has an unsupervised nature or once we implement systems that are based on this technology they have an unsupervised nature and one of these one of the characteristics of these are smart contracts so a smart contract is a contract that executes on the completion of um, uh, milestones that are that are that are uh, either uh, transmitted through the front end system or or that, that enter at through the back end which is the dlt system i'll talk a bit more about these definitions as i go through but um, these, this enables, um, this greatly improves um, the efficiency of these business processes because if a payment can be triggered, for example, let's say a delivery milestone is achieved that automatically delivers a, a payment. Um, and that, uh, that payment is made on the back of the trust that's built into the DLT system, which I'll also talk a bit about. So I'm touching on some issues without clarifying now, but I will over the course of these, these, um, these slides. Um, so, but in summary, um, what, what uh, DLT, digital ledger technology can facilitate trade through is greater transparency. So uh, transparency, uh, verifying um, the, 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 firstly, the type of goods that they're consistent with the declaration, and then the other procedural requirements, such as the origin, um, if applicable, the CITO and phytosanitary requirements and the technical requirements, those can all be um, entered in a safe um a verified way through the through the, the system, the, 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 the DLT system. And that can greatly improve the trans, transparency. Secondly, the accessibility of a set of transactions. So um, if any, any user at any point in the system, given that they have the, the authentication, will be able to access the, the information. So whether that's usually that the, um, the trade authority wants to verify 
aspect of the of the shipment and that information will already be entered into the blockchain and verified and that will that will lead to what are what i'm call what i what i refer to as unsupervised transactions where transactions and approvals can take place without excessive human intervention and that's where things slow down and where problems occur and also where, where avenues exist for abuse of the system and finally and i just added this in there the aggregation of this data for analysis uh, i was involved with jamie in a large project last year looking at preferential trade utilization and a big issue was was accessing um customs data uh transaction level customs data um and and if we have a system like this that will be just one of the if you like almost a free byproduct of having the the system in place oh, I've gone the wrong way so if i if i go through my slides i'm going to expand on some of the issues I, i've spoken and michelle also did um did refer to some of these and uh, jamie touched on some of these in his opening address as well the trust aspect so when you have a dlt system um trust is built in trust is baked in uh, to the distributed nature of the of the of the blockchain um they i believe that there's the, the paper does go into some of the technical issues but they uh, all the technical information but there's more to be found elsewhere if anyone wants to find out how the, the database is distributed and how it's verified it's actually quite fascinating i think michelle said blockchain is boring but it actually it is it actually is interesting if you if you really go down to the nitty gritty so these this information refers to dispatch information shipping details customs declarations and payments e payments transit locations and the final delivery um are all there and anyone as i said who has the accreditation can go in and can look uh, at this information which is part of a larger um trade system um upon which uh variety of smaller systems are, are built we'll talk about that number 2 you can remove intermediaries in the, the project we did last year on preferential trade utilization quite a few of these small businesses responded that they used uh couriers and third parties to um to execute their cross border trades uh, and that always comes at a price that comes at at, at commission which reduces the return to the small small business and that's we, we don't need that we want small businesses to be able to earn a greater return and therefore to be able to grow so when when you have a, a dlt system that allows the entry and the verification and the transparency of this information there's much less need for intermediaries obviously if intermediaries play a role in the physical movement of goods that's that's different but where they're playing a role in um a compliance with procedures that will be greatly um um improved or or, or their their role will be greatly reduced through dlt so the dlt driven marketplace allows buyers and sellers to interact directly with each other and without the costly and time consuming agency of intermediary so there's a big cost saving there thirdly the participation of trade authorities this is really the big um gain um one of the others uh, speakers mentioned the government and this comes up again and again um a trade system that is supported by a dlt back end will be a form of e government where um the the traders the exporters and importers interact with the system system that's uh, that's a government uh, system a government uh, website a government portal but that is sits on a common dlt back end to which those individual traders have access so these are the customs and excise authority they enforce the various requirements the origin requirements the sps requirements and tech, technical requirements and those can now be be given that those informations are entered into this dlt back end the uh, trade authority system which sits on top of that can automatically or very efficiently verify these um, those requirements so we can include the agencies in the dlt information process simplify their role in overseeing the passage of goods into their territories you can integrate it into a single window system the entry point of all required data is the original ledger entry which is then passed to the customs and excise system so a single window means that you you have the both the import and the export country in fact this should be done at a multilateral level as i say in my conclusion uh but you you have this the um the two customs authorities for the the exporting and importing nation that are um uh, they are part of the same system and have access to the same data the way the data is formed is the same for both of them um the the uh the the trader does not have to comply with a different uh, setup for the for completes all the forms for the export and then a new a type of forms maybe for the importer all of that's a waste time and this this kind of system would obviate that 
Um, so what this is pointing towards then is the, the um, ability to pre-process uh, these pre-processed transactions that are cross-border. And this is the same way that courier shipments are pre-processed. Um, I don't know if it's how many of these people, how many it applies to, but if I order uh, something online from overseas and if I use a, a courier such as DHL or, um, or FedEx, um, I get an email or a phone call saying they've pre pre-authorized it and I just need to pay the following that they've assessed my my custom duties and and they've got their disbursement fee and that just gets paid and um, the item is pre-authorized before it even arrives in the country so it's just a formality so this is this takes it a step further by the customs authorities being uh, in the same single window system supported as i said by a dlt which um, ensures trust and ensures transparency so Payments are then can then be automated. When I get the uh, when I get a call from the courier, I, I do the EFT later that day. I know that it's uh, occasionally one one wants to interrogate their um, their uh, classification or their declaration of the goods, but usually um, there isn't a problem with that. Also, um, the accommodating of value chains. Um, so we know that the world economy uh, today is characterized uh, by not just by single nations such as China. Um, manufacturing things, but China itself draws uh, part of its um, um, inputs from the surrounding uh, Southeast Asian countries, and and may export finished or, or, or semi-finished products, which are then which are then could be finished in a different country. So um, global and regional value chains are a reality of um, the of world in, in industry, and um, these but these need to be taken into account, especially where origin is an issue in uh, in, in in preferential trade areas. So we know that. When we have a free trade area, origin origin issues are very important um, in order to avoid uh, uh, diversion and deflection of, of trade. Um, and so the system can be robust to the requirements of these double value chains if you have the, uh, the originating uh, manufacturer, both of the inputs and of the semi-finished products all go into the digital ledger. Um, the the uh, origin can be much more quickly and easily um, ascertained. And this can also obviate these origin certificates that are that are you know the whole of bureaucracy to apply for. There and there's an overhead, and they're also temporary. They only last for six months, and then the uh, the exporter or the importer has to then apply for them again. All of these are are trade barriers. All of these uh, are lead to border friction, and we don't want them going forward into the uh, the um, African continental free trade area. We want to try and make things as fluid as possible. Um, the uh, and the DLT system can do this. Um, human agency is not entirely obviated. We're not going to make um, people completely irrelevant to the situation. Um, the, the, D, the DLT driven trade facilitation system would remove um, unnecessary points of intervention by humans and also remove points of intervention by humans where which can lead to abuse and and, and corruption and rent seeking behavior. But uh, some, such as the physical inspection of goods, admittedly, these these areas can also lead, lead to abuse. Uh, physical inspection of goods will still, still need human agency, uh, but at some point in the near future, there'd be a robotic agency. This is tangential, but I do want to refer to this. There's a business in uh, in Durban, in South Africa, that uses drones to do stock take. They, these drones will fly around inside a warehouse and will use um, uh, scanning, will use sensors to scan uh, QR codes and, and other codes on products to, to do stock take. And so it's not unfeasible that at some point the inspection of goods where it doesn't involve the actual opening of, of, of items can be automated. So we want to make, without, uh, without um, uh, you know, a necessary removal of human agency, we would like to make remove human agency where the technology is clearly superior. So then my conclusions uh, would, 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 and the recommendations to policymakers would be that um, a DLT-based system is clear, can greatly assist with cross-border trade and in enhancing inter-African trade. Um, we recommend that this be taken up at the multilateral level, which at this point is the continental AFCFTA level. It's very important that this is not done in silos. Uh, if countries and, and RECs, the, the uh, African RECs, work in silos, then you can have conflicting systems. So. The, the, the DLT back end, uh, in other words, the, the, uh, the, the, the foundational uh, digital ledger technology 
should be developed and the front end should be developed in a coordinated manner. And uh, Michelle uh, referred to APIs, it stands for Application Programming Interface. These can be simply developed, uh, these can be developed to allow the, the digital ledger technology back into the interface for these front ends. And the front ends are the single window systems, but not just the single window systems, also the, the systems that the, um, the companies would use, it would, in, it would integrate with their, um, their supply chain so that they can, um, so that origin issues and, um, and uh, issues relating to um, the value chains can be dealt with. So final point, Blockchain is a form of digital ledger technology, um, but it's not the only one. Uh, and there, there are other ones out there. It's just the first one. It's just the, the, the best known one. But I would say African countries need a form of DLT that's sufficient when it comes to resource requirements. The problem with blockchain is that it, it's, it's very resource hungry because the entire blockchain is distributed to all of the nodes. Um, and there are more uh, relatively old technology in, the, in, in terms of technology, which ages very fast. Um, there are new, new systems and, and Africa should look, the AFC TFTA should look at adopting a newer, more efficient system that doesn't have the same um, resource requirements. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I'll hand back now to, um, to, the, uh, to the convener and uh, look forward to take any, any questions um, a bit later. John. Thank you very much indeed. That was extremely interesting and, and a, a tremendous uh, introduction to the whole issue of blockchain to help um, get goods across frontiers. And, and again, it, 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 it uh, suggests to me that we shouldn't look only at uh, digital or only at the production of goods. We need to look at the two together in parallel. So. Uh, it's now my great um, uh, my great uh, honor to to introduce uh, Zuzuki Zuki, sorry uh, Sonny. He is the founder and CEO of Brown Sense, a South African uh, community which was created uh, based on on Facebook communities. So over two hundred thousand customers or clients or whatever you like to call it. What is fascinating is that a lot of the people who are his customers are also sellers via his, um, via his platform, which makes it one of the uh, most interesting examples of how e-commerce is not just big companies like Jam Jamila or Jamil or, or um, Take A Lot or wherever. It is made up of enormous number of very small uh, sole proprietors or sole traders who are making one or two products and uh, living, making a living, perhaps doing something else, but this is their. Uh, extra money coming in or whatever. Um, Brown Sense has now also uh, launched a platform uh, in Africa and uh, we have talked about e-commerce. Um, uh, Jean Bertrand mentioned uh, a number of times the protocol which is going to be uh, negotiated this year by the African free trade area on e-commerce. So I'd like to um, pass over to Mizu, please, it's over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Alastair. Um, good day, everyone. I'm just opening my video up. It's a bit slow on my side. Um, let me see if the picture is clear enough, but um, thank you for the introduction, Alastair, again. Um, so I think maybe a, a great place to start is uh, just maybe say something if you guys can see me clearly um, in the chat section. So um, underlying the founding um, and the, 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 the launching of the Brown Sense Group, which was in 2016, um, we've just now recently celebrated our fifth year anniversary on the 13th of Jan. Um, it was the principle of doing what you have, um, you know, uh, or, or rather starting with what you have, where you are. 
And for me, where that comes from is, you know, from, from years and years of experience in terms of you come up with an idea and this is, you know, through failed, uh, you know, um, experiences and from where the learnings come, that you, you have an idea, then you sort of wait until, um, if you imagine a road with, you know, a number of traffic lights, you wait for all of them to turn green before you can launch and move as opposed to, you know, the first one is green, you get to the next one, it's caution and red and so forth. So essentially it was to show people that um, each one of us has something at any given time or given moment to launch something or to take the first step. Um, the one other thing that I think I would love for you to take away from my uh, presentation, um, should you forget everything else that I'm going to say, is I'm going to quote and I'm going to share a link on the chat section as well um, so that you can read, read the article for yourself. Um, it's an article by uh, Mark Andreessen um, called It's Time to Build, which came up uh, shortly after, um, you know, we were thrown into, into the pandemic glo globally and, you know, quite a, uh, uh, unprecedented for, for all of us or most of us. And I believe that he had a number of things that really, um, you know, hit it on the nail for me when he spoke about it's time to build. And, and the idea behind that is, what this pandemic exposed is how um, unready we were. Um, you know, governments were not ready, hospitals were not adequately um, equipped, um, businesses big and small, you know, um, you, you, you might, uh, it might be easier to pick on the small guy and say, you know, it's either you are ready to automate or digitize, otherwise your business dies. But also we found that there were big businesses that you know were hard hit as a result of the pandemic because of not being ready and not anticipating or preparing for something as um, as, as 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 huge as as the pandemic or COVID nineteen. Um, I've just shared the link with you guys so you can share that. Sorry, um, go through it at your own time. Um, and so that's the, the 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 whole ethos around Brown Sense in terms of you know it's time to build. What can we do now? Because um, it, the, the, the data that we see, and I think if, if you are into reading this kind of, um, you know, uh, we currently have the COVID-19, we've had other um, challenges in the past around not as huge as the COVID-19, but is this really the last time that we have something as big as this? And if not, what are we doing to be ready for that time? Um, and how do we have it in our minds, in our strategic um uh, uh, planning to be equipped should that time happen, whether it's in the short term or the long term. So a couple of things I'm going to list um, that I believe uh, can be done, <clears throat> uh, pandemic or not, is that upskilling, you know, from a business perspective, my, my background is law, by the way. Um, I've worked as a commercial attorney. I've worked um, on a bit of some tech, uh, tech law deals, as well as media law, um, IP to, to a certain extent. Um, but one thing that I've always appreciated and uh, realized is that one needs to be relevant at any given time. And for me, I think it helps that, um, you know, I've been curious for the most, uh, most of my, my life. I think how I like to put it is that um, in South Africa, there's a term that says, Otanda is in the, or a liker of things, so to speak, uh, to, to loosely put it. But what that means for me is having the hunger and the curiosity to learn new, new skills, whether it's a new skill, a new subject matter, and so forth. What we've seen from a brown sense perspective, because where we are sitting, it's, it's kind of a front row seat where we get to see what are the challenges that a small business faces, um, is that there's a number of skills or gaps, you know, that that should be closed, and one can either by themselves get the access to those um, to those uh, um, um, insights, data, or whatever that they need to learn. But biggest for for me and what I've identified is that a lot of um, entrepreneurs that I've come across lack numeracy skills. So you'll have this great idea, one of the speakers uh, touched on um, how do we build an environment where we create um, uh, unicorns, right? So you've got all these brilliant business people and they've got 
you know, very talented in what they do, beautiful products, beautiful business or whatever that they do. However, when they stand in front of a room with potential funders and they need to speak to the numbers around their business, that's where you start to see the holes. That's where you start to see the gaps in terms of, yes, I hear you, great product, great business, but what are the numbers? Whether from a, 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 a projection point of view, from an industry perspective, in terms of the area or the industry that you operate in. And I believe that um, the roots of that largely may have to do with the underlying or the, the primary education that most of us got, you know, um, you know where, where, um, from an early age. So it's not something that me as an, as, a, as an adult lawyer would now all of a sudden say, hey, let me go and pick up the skill or whatever because of the number of years and maybe a great example to use is this, right? Um, my father was a, a lifesaver. This is a true story. Worked at a swimming pool, taught a lot of kids in Soweto how to swim. And um, I had a conversation with someone who asked me, what does your father do? And I told him, and his response was, oh, I thought black people don't know how to swim to my face, he says that. And um, I had to very calmly, you know, tell him the. You know, it's, it's a matter of opportunity, right? If you grow up in an area where there's opportunity, there's access, um, there's family environment that enables you to do that because there can be the infrastructure. But if I'm sort of a parent-led household where when I come back from school, I need to do what my parents would typ typically do, then guess what? There's no time or opportunity for me to access that infrastructure to get the skills. Um, the second... <clears throat> So I'm just focusing on numeracy skills, but truth be told, there's a number of other skills. Um, you know, one, one thing that I learned from the early days of um, starting Brown Sense was to learn to do certain things myself when there was no money to pay someone to do them. So for instance, I had to learn how to design a flyer. I, 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 I called on a graphic designer, helped me with this flyer. Um, he owed me a favor because I had done some legal work for him. Um, prior and um, you know the guy didn't show up when I needed him so I had to go online find a tool find something that I needed to how do I get this thing moving um, the biggest one um, that I've learned also is collaborations and I believe that for for where we are in the continent in order to fast track and get ourselves to the point where you know we are globally competitive um, there's a number of businesses that are growing and, and, and so forth. I believe that collaboration is a key thing. And obviously, I like to, I like to qualify it and say meaningful collaborations um, because it's easy to throw the word around and say, let's collaborate. And, and that, that happens around, you know, a, a lot um, around the space that we work in. Now, um, Brown Sense, our own case study is that because of this kind of thinking, in 2017, we launched... Um, an organization called the People's Fund, which um, is today a purchase order funding business, which means that if, if I get a government or a private sector even um, contract, uh, a tender, they give me a purchase order, but guess what? They're not going to pay me upfront to enable me to, to service my, um, uh, my, my obligations towards them. Then this is where the, uh, the, the People's Fund comes in. Um, you apply for the funding, we enable you to deliver. And this is, this is how we make, uh, make money, the business makes money. You know, um, the, I would like to believe that the biggest benefit also is that the, the customers of, if it's a government, the government get a service that is delivered and, then, and therefore we don't have service delivery problems. Um, and since then, we've uh, enabled or financed over 130 million rands in purchase orders. Um, enabling businesses um, to, to, to fulfill on their POs or their, or their orders. Now, this is not a brown sense thing by itself. There's four other organizations that form the People's Fund. And, <clears throat> excuse me, hence my emphasis um, on, on collaborations or meaningful collaborations to get to the point where you see a, a, you know, um, a meaningful outcome and there's great impact as well. Um, so I know that, um, you know, my, my focus primarily should be on what business can do. I think some of these sort of, um, 
uh, crossover, you know, between what can be done from the other side, whether it's, it's, it's government or maybe big business in this case. And the key thing is that it's, it's well and, 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 you know, lovely to encourage um, people to be savvy, te- te- technologically savvy, right? Um, automate their businesses and all that. Without the infrastructure to back it up, I think that remains a, a, another talk that happened and there's no um, impact, there's, not, there's no outcome, there's nothing that will be shown towards, here's the idea, here's the concept, um, you know, what happened subsequent to what was put out from this idea. So if the data is expensive, if the internet is not reliable, if um, we've got issues around, around load shedding, for instance, or I think it's called uh, load, load reduction now, um, how, how do we make this beautiful sounding thing on the one side, a reality, a lived experience for the people that want to execute when there's a lot of hurdles along the way. And I believe that this is where um, there needs to be a, a, a mix between political will, you know, where we take this thing from paper and how do we make it and execute it and make it a practical experience. Um, and also I, I, I'm, I'm glad that a lot of the speakers earlier touched on legal framework because what I've seen is <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll be looking at, at things from a South African perspective, but now and then, for whatever reason, I might need to look at um, data privacy laws, for example, in, um, uh, let's say, the DRC, for argument's sake. And then, um, you know, firstly, the issue becomes accessibility to that information. Um, secondly, it might be that, you know, we are not all at the same level in terms of do we all have this similar types of legal framework when, uh, for instance, not long ago, we had this whole issue around WhatsApp updating its terms and conditions. Everyone got uh, a little bit excited and, you know, wanting to move to other apps that that can be used. But now, um, if you're in a region where the law in your country does not really um, provide adequate protection, then what is the, what, 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 what does that mean for you? And I believe these are the types of things that um, you know need to move from being uh, theory to, to be looked at and then to be executed. One other thing that I've seen from a law, uh, you know, accessibility framework is that you'll find that a lot of the platforms or some of them that, that sort of try to consolidate different um, country laws within the African continent are not African companies. Um, you know, I think most would be situated in, in, in Europe where they've consolidated using lawyers in the continent um, to say, if you want to access the, you know, uh, and maybe the nature of your work from time to time, you need to compare, uh, do a comparison between different country legislation uh, or maybe your business even, because one doesn't want to go into a country or, or, or a jurisdiction and not know what the legal, legal framework, what taxes are you going to be paying? How do you set up a company in that space? Um, you know, do you need to have a local in that space being part of your business so that you can be allowed to operate and, and those types of things? Um, being mindful of time. So the other thing that, you know, um, have been a great le- learning from the past five years is, and I feel like the, the past five years really compressed a lot of learning for me, and I, I, I believe it has a lot to do with obviously the work that we do as Brown Sense. Um, is when it comes to funding, what we've learned, and I believe also coming from the thinking, the two the two ideas around start with what you have, uh, where you are, as well as collaboration, is looking beyond you know the typical funding instruments that um, that that we that we hear of the most, if I may put it like that. Um, so, for instance, we've started stock fans. Um, I'm not sure if that's a word that's familiar to to all of you, but um, a friend calls a stock fell a um, it's it's a okay. So they say a crowdfunding platform is like a stock fell that went to private school. Uh, otherwise, they're both the same thing, more or less, in terms of getting a lot of you know people involved, committing to contribute contributing X amount for a certain period of time towards an agreed objective. And as a result of that collaboration and bringing people together in that space, we've seen now um, what is going to be launched as a cooperative bank, 
um, possibly in a year or two that initially started as the brown sand stock fell and then uh, we changed it to become the people stock fell um, and a number of other stock fells that are coming up around the franchise space where now people can collectively be able to own um, a franchise brand it can be a restaurant or whatever that they agree on property stock fells and so forth how they get managed this is the very exciting part is that we we work closely with a fintech based platform that manages this whole um, you know uh, funding or the stock funds in a transparent way so i can start a stock fell for you uh, uh, i mean with people that i mean johannesburg in south africa someone might be based in let's say the eastern cape um, you know all different parts of the country we've never met we don't know each other and all that but because of the transparency that this um, platform provides then everyone is able to see you know um, where the money sits what it's used for uh, it never moves without certain um, you know um, um, quality checks or processes have been followed Ms. okay I want to ask you to to wrap up because we're yes. really running out of time now Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Alastair. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll close with these two, maybe maybe three. Um, obviously, because of the nature of, of opportunities that are at hand, um, it therefore means that a lot of businesses need to become export ready. And, and I think, again, this must not be a situation where people get left behind because of lack of knowledge, lack of skill, um, or access to information. Um, and also, I've, I, I had noted for a reason, I think, in my mind linked to the current situation, um, you know, that it's also, I believe it's also key and pertinent that in our spaces, we find a way on how we focus on climate change. It's not a conversation that comes up a lot in, in the small business side of things, because, you know, um, maybe it sounds like it's beyond us or it's for the government to take care of or big business or whatever. But um, I believe that there's something that each and every one of us can play because um, what, what I've been reading, and I'm not the expert in this area, this is based on what um, uh, the people that are experts in those areas is that there could be a link between climate change and um, uh, the, the increasing rate of pandemics. And if that's the case, I think there needs to be a focus on that space. Um, I will end it there and um, thank you for the opportunity. And if I get any um, chance to answer questions, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Mizu, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, can I now turn to our last speaker, Yvonne uh, Kagon, Kan, Kaganu? I, I beg my pardon if I don't pronounce that properly. Um, we have talked over time, particularly Michelle mentioned the issue of currencies and currency issues. Um, so Yvonne runs the um, Kenyan uh, Paxful, which is a system uh, for Bitcoin and looks at cryptocurrencies in that way. And I think this is a, a very good end to, to our session to look at the possibilities there. Over to you, Michelle. Could you please keep to time? Thank you very much, Intei. Hi, Alistair. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, and to be, uh, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the authors of the paper, Michelle and Alistair, for inviting me to be the speaker of this session. And um, I do agree with the key po points that you have highlighted on the paper, and I want to commend you for what you've written. And um, as I'm the final panelist, I would, I'll would i try my best to be as brief as possible in the interest of time. And uh, I'd like to start by saying, um, of course, being in the Bitcoin industry, I have had, the, I have been privileged to witness uh, firsthand in a way free trade within Africa. And even as we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, I would like to give the example of Kenya and what we've seen in Kenya during the COVID period. And to create uh, some context, I want to give a, a brief introduction to Paxful and what we do here in Africa. We are a people powered marketplace for buying and selling Bitcoin as uh, Alistair had introduced. And uh, we like calling ourselves the Jumia of Bitcoin or the eBay or the Uber of Bitcoin, where um, it's a meeting place for 
willing buyers and willing sellers of Bitcoin. We were formed in 2014 by our founders, Ray and Artur, and five years down the road, we are, uh, we are the, we're the largest uh, peer-to-peer marketplace for Bitcoin, and Africa is our biggest market. 50% uh, of our volumes come from Africa. And um, our leading markets are Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, and Cameroon. And now diving into what uh, we've seen here in the country in Kenya, um, we've registered over, we, last year alone during the COVID era, we registered over 60,000 new users and we had a 480% increase in volume in the country. And all this happened during the Corona COVID uh, period where of course we were expecting um, losses of jobs and we were expecting a lot of people to be at home and um, yeah, but for Kenya, I'd say that we were already suffering the burden of youth unemployment. We had a, a large amount of youth coming into the workspace and there were no jobs uh, taking them in. So when uh, COVID happened, it sort of, uh, we were ready in a way for for that. And this actually helped boost um, Paxful and uh, other online uh, trade systems as well as online careers. and. Um, uh, for example, in Kenya, we have the highest and still have the highest internet penetration in Africa at 87%. And these fast speeds are enabling Kenyans to try out new technologies. And on top of that, Kenyans and Kenyan youths are very educated. Um, in, back in 2002, uh, free compulsory primary education was launched by the then president Mwai Kibaki. Uh, and uh, as a um, previous speaker was um, listing, I was discussing about um, education. So, and it's important, especially the primary education. So what we have in Kenya is a youth that is very educated, um, very empowered, and they, are, they have access to fast internet and they are unemployed, which was also um, sort of catalyzed by the Corona period. So, and it's easy, as we all know currently, it's very easy to access like a, a smartphone, for example, with $50, at least here in Kenya, you can have access to Kenya and to a smartphone and um, Paxful, that's all you need to join. That's all you need to have to access Bitcoin because uh, Bitcoin is money on the internet, uh, it's currency on the internet. So when you have that, you're enabled and you can actually, uh, someone once told me that once you have your smartphone, you have the world at your hands. And um, Bitcoin was first introduced to Kenyans through freelancers and um, who are online workers, which is some type of service trade. And it, it when they were looking for a faster and a more convenient way to receive and send payments uh, across borders. And when they discovered Bitcoin, they also discovered an opportunity to make money through arbitrage and uh, price fluctuations. So what we often see on Paxful is that a Kenyan would buy a Bitcoin from a South African and maybe sell to a Nigerian. And Bitcoin in a way, is, uh, in as much as it is a currency, it's also an asset to a group of people. And uh, when we are talking about African trade and African and the African free trade area, our users in Kenya and in other regions in Africa are already practicing this. And Bitcoin is not limited to borders, so it's, uh, it, it's really suitable for the area. And when we are discussing our regulation for Kenya, um, uh, it's still a quite of a gray area because uh, the government recently, uh, a couple of years uh, back, took an initiative to, send, to set up a task force to, on which they would, add, um, they would receive advice on matters related to blockchain and Bitcoin. And um, so far, so good. The, the tax, task force made a report encouraging the government to think of it in a positive note because the government is aware of the sort of situation we have with the youth unemployment. And they also set up, um, uh, they have an initiative to encourage more youth to take up um, online jobs, online uh, opportunities that come up. And they have a platform called Ajira, which Ajira is, Ajira is Swahili for... Uh, employment, <laughs> employment. So uh, they do encourage more youths to um, to come up into such spaces where they have opportunities to uh, elevate their situations that they are in, and also to echo what um, our previous speaker 
spoke in the previous session, uh, in the previous panel about institutions. And um, for instance, the education institution, as I had mentioned earlier, if it wasn't for uh, the decision that was made 20 years back about making um, education in the country compulsory and affordable, free, um, we couldn't see the impact of this now. And uh, as uh, as Paxful, we're very keen on uh, people powered, and uh, our government has really tried to bring this power back to the youths and um, the youths who are educated, the youths who are empowered. And uh, similar to what we are trying to do, they recently they launched um, a Google Loom in the country to enable internet uh, to be received in remote areas in the. In the in the country, so we see that the institution is really uh, focused on trying to empower more people, like what we do in Paxful, which is uh, people powering. And um, so, what I'd like to uh, to uh, finish by saying is that um, institutions are should focus on empowering more people to elevate the situations that they're in. And um, in the interest of time, I'd like to end there. Thank you. Yvonne, thank you very much indeed for, for that and, 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 and for keeping brief as well. Um, what we just uh, been looking at um, between uh, Cyril, who was, who's been one of the organizers here, um, we will skip the Q and A's uh, because uh, most of them have been answered. I think all of them have been answered. Um, by the speakers previously. So thank you very much indeed to, to those speakers who, who answered those questions. I'd like to just make two points um, to conclude before passing on to Elizabeth. The first one is something which um, as a marketing guy uh, over many, many years, I'm very keen on. And that is the issue of um, promoting the African free trade area. Uh, and indeed, uh, going back to what I said earlier, the idea that we need to ensure that made in Africa is a quality uh, brand. Alistair, I think we've lost you. We can't hear you. We see you, but we can't hear you. I don't know if it's your, I think it's your connectivity is a bit low. Talking about uh, digital disruptions. <laughs> Uh, Alistair, perhaps just turn off your screen, uh, turn off your video, you and uh, I think it might enable it. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can see. Yes, yes. Good, great, excellent. So just to conclude, I think what we need also to look at is the marketing of the African free trade area and indeed the marketing of Africa as a production hub as a place which produces quality goods. Um, and this is something that I would, I would like to add to the deliverables. We've, we've looked at nearly every single of the recommendations that we made in the paper. I'm delighted to say that they've all been supported uh, and that uh, uh, Michelle and I will correct in, in putting down those uh, recommendations. And we will uh, plan to put those forward as deliverables uh, from um, this, this uh, conference, if we're allowed to. And the final thing is uh, that Michelle and I will be looking at uh, another paper for SIA um, this year, which will be on value chains, value chain networks, which we believe are key to the process of building uh, African industry uh, and raising standards. So please watch this, this space. I'm going to pass over to Elizabeth, uh, having thanked again my uh, um, contributors in my panel. Over to you, Elizabeth, to close. Thank you. Great. Uh, many thanks. Um, many thanks, Alistair. Uh, this has really been a, a, a fascinating uh, discussion. I've learned a lot. I can't say I, I understand everything about blockchain, but it's, uh, it's, it's really been uh, fascinating. And I think I'm slowly getting into understanding it uh, more. Um, please note in the chat, uh, in the chat box, there is a, a link to our evaluation. 
um, forms. It would be really great if, if you guys could take a, a, a few minutes, literally. It's, it's, it's not a very long evaluation uh, to complete it if you just click on the link. Just by way of, of conclusion, I, I know we've, we've run a little bit over time, but perhaps just to highlight a couple of, 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 of quick points. We, we all agree this is a huge opportunity. The free trade area can act as an enabler of digital commerce, uh, digital trade, digital economy, but that itself can act uh, and help to facilitate and speed up uh, the free trade area. I think institutions are key. Uh, they need to be agile. They need to, to, uh, to engage with the private sector and with communities. I think that's something that has also come out that's very important. There needs to be trust, and I think trust in the institutions, trust in the regulatory frameworks as well, and we saw how important trust is uh, for any effective policy making uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. We also know that the speed of change is phenomenal. Uh, and that while we need to preserve our policy spaces on the continent, we also need to move quickly so that we're not overtaken by global events. And I think that's, that's an important uh, consideration. We also need to ensure in this, in this regulatory uh, context that uh, there are the right incentives to actually uh, create this ecosystem uh, that also uh, that a number of colleagues uh, spoke, about, uh, spoke about this morning. Um, I mean, there was it was a very rich conversation where we're talking about IPRs, the protocols that need to be in place, the issue of data privacy and cybersecurity, um, blockchain, and 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 so on and so on and so on. But I think what is uh, perhaps the, the most important point to to consider as as a parting comment is the issue of, of inclusivity. That what this uh, new phase of economic development should not do is further uh, condemn to the margins uh, the losers, because they're always winners and losers. And what is important in, in this conversation and in, 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 in the broader policy discussion is how to ensure that there is, where there are losers, we can deal with them, we, we can help to uh, we can help to make them winners. Uh, uh, we can spread uh, the, the benefits of, of technology more widely and also recognize that technology can also help existing traditional sectors, traditional, uh, uh, traditional areas of, of, of economic uh, um, act activity as, as well. And here I think small business have an important role to play and we've heard a, a lot about that. So that's just by way of highlighting some of the things that, I'm, that I've taken away uh, from this discussion this morning. Thank you again very much for participating. I'm sorry we couldn't have a, a, a much more engaged uh, discussion with uh, the colleagues, and with the, with the audience, but I'm glad that all the questions were, were addressed. Uh, please do fill in the, uh, the, the evaluation form. We will also be sending out the link to the, uh, to the YouTube video uh, together with the PowerPoint presentations and so on which uh, will also be loaded onto our website. A very big thank you to Alistair, to Michelle, to my colleagues uh, at, in the economic diplomacy team, Cyril and, and, and Tawanda, uh, and to the, the panelists who, uh, who were willing to participate this morning. And of course, lastly, to you, the audience. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, um, have uh, enjoyed the rest of the day and uh, we'll see you soon again on this platform.